Hello and welcome to today's Eurostar webinar, Stop the Rot, Banishing Flakiness from Selenium Tests with Simon Stewart. My name is Paul and I'll be your webinar moderator today. Before I hand over to Simon, I'd just like to bring a few things to your attention. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A session, type it into your control panel and I will ask it on your behalf. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you when it's available. The slides and Simon's responses to your questions will be available on the Eurostar blog. If you would like to join the conversation on Twitter, please do so and use the hashtag ESConf. Before I hand you over to Simon, we're going to have a quick poll question, which is, who here has had a f flaky selenium or end-to-end -end test? You should see the poll results there now. Um, without further delay, I'll hand you over to Simon to um, present today's webinar. Good afternoon, Simon. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, you should have control now with your screen. Brilliant. There we go. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Simon Stewart. Um, welcome. So it's, it's good to know that lots of you have had flaky tests. I mean, it would be terrible to uh, spend my time here talking to you about how to banish flakiness if you never had that problem. Though I notice a quarter of you don't have it. Um, one of the things I like to do normally before starting is uh, just to sort of gauge a level of skill uh, from, hey, I really, really, really like writing code to uh, I have never touched a keyboard in my life and I never intend to. Um, but sadly, I wasn't terribly organized this morning. So uh, I'm going to assume that sort of you're, you, you can write code, but it's not your bread and butter. Uh, every day, um, and I will try and pitch this so that even if you've never coded before, you'll get something, and if you're a demon coder, uh, you'll get something from it as well. So um, the question is, sort of, are we doomed? Are we are we doomed to have flaky tests that always fail, um, and you know, a continuous build that is perpetually red? And you know, how do we stop the flakiness? Right, that's the the underlying question. How do we take our existing tests and make them as rock solid as humanly possible. Um, you know, it's something that we've struggled with uh, for a long time. Every job that I've been in where I've been doing end-to-end -end testing, this has been the fundamental problem that we've run into. And on every project, people go, you know, are these end-to-end -end tests delivering value? Because they're flaky and you can't trust a test that is flaky. You can't sort of go, okay, if it passes, that's good. If it fails, well, that's bad but it might be good, I don't know. You have no trust in it, and so you can't make decisions based on, on the results of those flaky tests. Uh, are we doomed? I don't think we are doomed. I think there's a, a lot of ways that, that we can get out of this. Um, hopefully, at the end of this presentation, you'll have picked some of those up. Um, but that, that big nope, that uh, you know we're going to be okay, comes with a caveat. And that caveat is this. If you refuse to write code, your tests are doomed to flakiness. Um, I know that sort of in a, in a QA community, there are, there are some people who find it um, harder to write code than, than, than you might imagine. Um, and I've been to conferences where sort of I've spoken to testers who are incredibly talented, and they've sort of built these fantastically baroque and complex ways of avoiding typing a little bit of Python. Um, I don't expect people to sort of sling code around like a, like a, like a developer all the time. Um, would be good, obviously, but it is not necessary. But sort of a basic familiarity with Java or Python or Ruby or C Sharp um, will make your life a lot easier. It will also make it easier for you to talk to your developers um, and, and sort of bridge the gap between testing and development. Um, so yes, we're not doomed, but it is going to take typing a few things on a keyboard occasionally. I'm sorry. So I think the first thing that sort of springs to mind, uh, and the only time we've ever really ever seen totally stable tests, is 
where the team works, the software development team actually works as a team. Um, your web app is a team effort, right? The, the thing you're trying to test has been developed by a group of uh, hopefully incredibly talented developers, um, UX people, you, business analysts, um, maybe involvement with the customer. Um, you know, so I think ensuring quality is a team effort, right? It's not something that you can sort of bolt on to the end. Um, you'll occasionally hear people sort of saying, well, you need to bake security into the product, um, or you need to, to make sure that performance is a, is a criteria that's met from the very, very beginning. Um, and quality is one of those things as well. You can't just write an app and then go, yep, fine, you know, now we'll make it stable and fast and effective and secure. Sorry. You can't make it fast, effective, and secure um, as, a, as an afterthought. Um, so, you know, it's a team effort, and that involves a couple of things. Um, I find that teams that work in an agile methodology, um, Scrum or XP or something like that, uh, get the most benefit out of, out of the approaches here, because they're used to working collaboratively and as a team, but there's no reason why this couldn't work in any particular software development, uh, development methodology. So what's, what's, what are the sources of flakiness? If we can understand the sources of flakiness, then we can go about actually improving them and rectifying them um, and helping to address them. First one is that a modern web app is typically composed of many different moving pieces. Um, you know, just, just take a look at a sort of traditional three-tier application. You've got the, the front end, which is running in the user's browser. Um, you've got the... Um, <clears throat> The, the back end, which is some sort of database, and then you've got the sort of middle tier, which sort of glues the two pieces together, which is running in some sort of app server. Um, now, all of those pieces and all the links between them need to be working effectively in order for your application to work. And most applications these days are a bit more sophisticated than just those three pieces. Um, you've got things like XML HTTP requests coming in from the, from the front end to, to your middle tier. Um, and you probably have to connect to more than one database or maybe a message queue or, um, you know, other, other components, Memcached perhaps. And so there's, there's all these moving parts. Now, the interesting thing is that each of these moving parts comes with, uh, comes with it, it, its own risk of failure. You know, the database goes down, you know, once every day on a Tuesday uh, because the database admins need to do some work. Um, Maybe the, the front-end environment that you use for your, your application testing is a shared environment, um, and periodically it becomes unavailable as new apps are loaded or new data stores are, are, are added. Um, and your back-end data store, you know, perhaps that, uh, that's a snapshot of data from production that's been suitably cleaned, and you know, periodically that snapshot needs to be reloaded, and suddenly all your tests fail because the assumptions they made um, are no longer valid. So how do you address this problem of, of having these moving parts that are totally under your control? Well, you know, one of them is to ask the software development team to, to allow for some level of abstraction. For example, databases uh, often allow you to replace them with some sort of in-memory um, application because developers tend to use some sort of object relational mapping tool, an ORM like Hibernate or uh, ADO. Uh, can be used this way, or uh, the uh, JEE uh, enterprise being um, persistence, uh, which, which you can do, this, the CMP in level three got particularly good. Um, so, you know, you can swap out the database that is remote uh, for a local one, and probably your app is still going to work because, hey, it's a level of abstraction, and, and your developers are computer scientists, and computer scientists solve problems with introducing levels of abstraction. Um, maybe, you know, your, your front end uh, could be run locally, you know, could you run IIS on your local uh, workstation, you know, um, when I do development, I use Jetty or uh, Webit uh, quite a lot to allow myself to, to run apps locally uh, effectively and quickly. So, you know, can you take these, these uh, vital dependencies of your application and somehow run them locally? Now, you know, if you do that, you will, of course, need to run a subset of tests against the more production-like environment. But for day-to-day -day testing, actually, the local approach works really well, and it addresses one of the primary concerns of, of 
uh, instability in tests, which is that some third party system has gone down. Talking of third party systems, um, not everything in the application is under your control. Um, I think of third parties as sort of existing on the edge of your application. Um, these are the things that you don't control. Uh, for example, one job I was at, I had a credit card processing gateway that I needed to send data to, and periodically that would be unavailable. Um, that was also the job where I racked up over $4,000 worth of charges on my boss's credit card because I said I needed some test data uh, and I needed to push through some transactions and he thought I was doing manual testing and I'd automated everything. So instead of doing 10 tests, I actually ran 400 um, and he was slightly horrified. Um, again, with these third parties, there are a number of approaches you can take. Uh, perhaps the third party vendor has provided an in-memory representation. Um, so JMS, the, the, the Java messaging service, um, may well have something like that. Um, I tend to replace uh, message queues with ActiveMQ or something similar in my Java applications. You can do something similar too. Um, the other thing that I've seen people do is stub out the back end system. If you're stubbing out the back end system, then sort of where your application touches that third party, wrap that, uh, that edge of your system in an API that you control. Because you control that API, you can now replace the, the implementation with one that does exactly what you want to do. If you find uh, classes and uh, method calls to third party systems scattered willy nilly throughout your application, you've got a problem and you're going to find it hard to introduce stability. So put a layer of abstraction around that third party system uh, and make sure that you can substitute in something sensible in your testing. That will help address the stability issues. The other thing to do is that when you run end-to-end -end tests against a production-like environment and you want to verify that you can actually communicate effectively with this third party, check that it's working before you send any tests that rely on it through the system. Um, that could be as simple as checking a, uh, a health uh, URL um, or it may involve sending a message through the system just to see whether everything's working the way you expect it to. But do wrap your third parties. Um, the other, the, the other really classic way of introducing flakiness to your tests is doing way too much in your test cases. Um, it's a sort of anti-pattern. I've seen tests where the test begins by logging into the, uh, the admin interface, creating a user, logging out of the admin interface, logging into the app as a newly created user, navigating through four or five different screens, performing the action that we actually wanted to test, and then exiting the system going back into the UI, uh, the admin UI, and deleting the user. Now, if you remember, every single part of our system is liable to failure. Our end-to-end -end tests require the entire system to be working. You're basically rolling the dice every time you perform an action on an end-to-end -end system. In order to reduce the, odd, the flakiness, you need to bring the odds down. And one way of bringing the odds down is to not do everything that you can do in a test. Um, just focus on the one thing that you actually care about. In order to do this, you might need to do things like uh, capture a cookie that is used to authenticate a user um, and, 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 and push that into the browser without going through the login mechanism um, directly. So uh, lots of logging, uh, log, login tools uh, have a, an API that you can, you can query to sort of say, okay, I want to authenticate as user X and you could do that. The other thing to do is to check the state that you expect the system to be in, not through the UI, but by querying the database or the underlying data store. Um, what's your test actually doing is a sort of question you have to ask yourself. And if you can shrink the test down to only doing those things, that's a really good thing to do. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. So. Um, it's time for the, the second poll. Um, so far, all these questions have been very much to do with, uh, all these questions, all these solutions have been sort of really, really abstract. None of them have anything to do with WebDriver or Selenium itself. Um, and so you might be going, well, you know, I knew that stuff. Um, we're now going to start going into uh, Selenium and some Selenium specific solutions. But before I do, um, it would be useful to know what kind of tools you guys are using. Um, I don't suppose there's any chance of getting the poll up, is there? 
Okay. Um, I can't see it. See the uh, results, <laughs> Simon? You guys can't either. Oh, I can't see the... Re oh, yeah. Okay. I can you see can the see results them? now. Thank you. Uh, okay. No problem. Yes, I can. Brilliant. So, 50% of you are, or just under 50% are using Selenium WebDriver. Um, some of you use a combination of the two, and there's a minority of people using IDE. Brilliant. Okay. So, uh, this should be um, stuff that most of you know then. Um, the Selenium toolchain is composed of a, of a number of different pieces. The first bit is Selenium IDE, which is a sort of record playback tool. Um, that's really good for helping you to, to, to bootstrap your testing processes, um, but it's not so good um, for sort of the long-term maintenance of your tests. Um, the thing that we recommend people to do is to move to Selenium RC, or preferably now that Selenium 2 is out, Selenium WebDriver. These are APIs in programming languages such as Python, Java, Ruby, C Sharp. Um, there are PHP clients, there are Perl clients. Um, you can pick any language that you like and you could probably find a binding for them. Um, these allow you to, to write maintainable tests. Now, your tests speak. Someone will look at your testing code and will go, we'll, we'll look at the tests you write and will try to understand which part of the system you're trying to, to test. Um, this means that sort of if you have the raw web driver or, or Selenium RC APIs poking through into your tests, you may have the wrong level of abstraction. Um, I can't tell what well, find this element and then click on it and then find this other element and type into this actually is doing. Um, and from that high level description, I don't think either of you, any of you could either. Um, but if I said to you, oh look, go to the login page click the remember me button and then type in your password, then that's a far, far, far clearer way of, of expressing what you do. Um, so to try and help make your tests clearer um, and to reduce the duplication in them, uh, we recommend using a, a pattern called the page object pattern. A page object is a sort of Janus-like object. Um, facing one way towards the tests and your developers, you've got the services offered by a page, and facing the other way, You've got the deep underlying knowledge of the, uh, the, the, the sort of underlying structure of the HTML. Um, and that's the thing that you sort of, that, that is most likely to change and introduce flakiness. Um, I guess if you've used Selenium IDE, you've seen what happens when you sort of change part of the workflow in your application, and suddenly none of the tests pass until you've gone through every single test and modified the sort of one or two pieces of HTML that have changed. By using a page object, you can reduce that duplication. You can also allow your tests to be clear and to express the intent of the thing you're trying to test rather than the actual uh, mechanics of how that's done. Of course, once you start writing some code, um, particularly page objects, you, you run at the risk of writing spaghetti code, right, where it gets incredibly complicated and uh, fantastically difficult. Um, there's no need for, for code to be particularly hard to read. Um, a couple of layers of, of abstraction, you know, a page, a test, and then a page object, and then the page object knowing, knowing how to do things is probably enough in a simple case. Um, you know, the, the, the acronym KISS, uh, keep it stupidly simple, should be borne in mind. Um, the idea here is, is that the code is trying to help you get things done. If you find, actually, that you find it simpler to sort of have the same duplicate code all over the place, even though the sort of programming practices don't repeat yourself, it's okay to have that code repeated, provided that the code is easy to read and easy to maintain. Um, you might find this simpler if you're not a great developer yourself. If you write your testing code pairing with a software developer or a member of the development team, um, if you're practicing uh, a, an agile methodology, you may well be doing test-driven development, um, where you test up front. Um, in this case, it's a really good idea to just sit down with the person who's working on a feature and guide them writing some sort of good end-to-end -end test that describes the functionality that you want to test. Um, I hope that makes sense. So, you know, you're writing these tests. You've got simple code that's clean and easy to read. Um, the next thing that I see introduce a lot of brittleness and flakiness into people's tests are complex lo locators for finding elements. Um, typically, these locators are written in XPath, um, and they're incredibly brittle. So, um, you know, an XPath expression basically is a is a set of directions through the 
through the DOM to sort of try and find the, the one element you want. And it's incredibly um, uh, dependent on the structure of the HTML. And you're the only person who's aware of the fact that it's incredibly dependent on the structure of the HTML. Um, and so your designers will change things, your developers will change things, and suddenly your locators will break, even though the test should continue to pass. There's a couple of things you can do to make this easier. The first thing to do is to avoid um, using locators that only testing will use. Um, I like to recommend people use uh, CSS selectors because your UX team, your, your designers, your, your front-end developers are using CSS to mark up key parts of the interface. Those are probably the same key parts of the interface that you want to interact with in your test. So CSS is great. The other thing you can do if you're using WebDriver is rather than searching the entire document for the element that you want, you can search the subtree. You can find an element using find element uh, or find elements, and then you can start another search from that found element using another call to find element from that element. Um, that allows you to sort of write uh, slightly more composable uh, structures, and it makes it easier to write page objects as well, representing sort of components on a page. Take, for example, the sort of Facebook timeline or the Gmail inbox, where these repeated pieces of information that contain sort of slightly different things. You know, the timeline consists of a number of boxes, each showing uh, the, the activity of your friends, and the inbox on Gmail, uh, although each of the messages has the same structure, you've got the sort of the, the, the person who sent it and the subject and, you know, a couple of things on each line. Um, you could model those in the same way if you could start your search from a single element and WebDriver makes that possible. So avoid complex locators, break them down. In the ideal world you'd use an ID to locate an element. It's near constant time lookup, um, it's highly efficient and your test will run faster. Ah, yeah, running fast. Um, when you tell someone how to do something, you probably leave out all the little gaps and the pauses. Um, if I was to say to you, do a search on Google, I'd say, you know, go to Google, type this into the search box, and then click the third result that says cheese, for example. What I don't say is, type www.google.com into the search bar. When the page has finished loading, um, then find the element that contains, uh, that with, by the name Q, and type in hello world. Then find the button that submits the form. Then wait for all the search results to be displayed then find the third result, search result. There are all these implicit pauses that we put in. Um, the WebDriver API allows you to, to model both implicit and explicit weights, which is what you need to be able to do. An implicit weight is one where we don't put a, a weight statement into your code, um, and we replace that by having the, uh, the, the framework itself do some fairly simple polling. Um, it will do two things. Uh, an implicit weight will, for an option that uh, is merely interrogating uh, the DOM and trying to get information out of it, an implicit weight will wait until at least one element that matches a locator is found. And if you're interacting with it, it will wait until that element is visible before uh, interacting with it. And you can set the timeout uh, yourself. By default, we set the timeout to zero milliseconds. We disable implicit weighting. And the, the reason why we do that is fundamentally because I disagree with implicit weighting. Um, I think that you should be aware of what your application is doing, how it is doing it, and when it is making an external call and you expect the system to take some time. To handle this case, we have a set of classes called wait uh, is the name of the interface, fluent wait, and you probably use it the web driver wait. These take an expected condition. Um, which allows you to poll for slightly more sophisticated uh, changes to the state of the system. You can wait for the presence or the lack of presence of an element. Uh, you can wait until things become visible um, or not visible. But you can also wait uh, for custom conditions like, hey, you know, wait until this particular thing has happened, um, or you can wait until the URL contains a particular string or something like that. The problem with an explicit wait is you actually have a wait statement in your code. If you're writing your tests um, and, and your test API is poking through all the way to the test level, um, then this is going to make your test look really ugly. If you're using a page object, actually, it doesn't look too bad. I think it looks quite nice. 
and we've structured things to try and make the code nice and readable. So go and have a look at WebDriver Wait next time you need to do that. Um, as a note of caution, never use thread.sleep or the equivalent. Um, it doesn't do what you think it does. You need to wait until your application is ready for you to proceed rather than to wait an arbitrary amount of time. In the best case, you may be waiting too long. In the worst case, you're playing the averages and, uh, the standard, and occasionally you'll get an outlier. So even though the application is working, it may not be working fast enough and your thread.sleep will return too soon. So I said that you could wait for an explicit condition um, that your application tests. So one of the ways that we find to reduce flakiness in tests is to get the application under test to help. Um, it doesn't need to be a struggle where you sort of try and manage things yourself. Um, you can see this quite often where uh, uh, one, of the, one of the teams at Google actually, the Maps team, did something really impressive. Um, in their testing, what they did is they kept on a JavaScript variable a log of all the activity they'd seen. And their tests basically used that log to synchronize, to go, has the click that I just sent to the system returned? Um, has the UI updated? Uh, is the system in a, in a state that I expect it to be? Um, I tested an application recently and I was using the UI, uh, the accessibility UI that they added. Um, and this allowed me to sort of, it was an Ajax app so it never did a page reload. It just sort of pulled in new tabs and, and did that sort of slick web 2.0 thing that we, we so love these days. Um, and I could query the accessibility API and I could ask it sort of, what view do you think you're showing right now? Um, and so on and so forth. So uh, when I clicked on a button and I expected the view to change, I'd do the click and then I'd poll with an explicit wait uh, until the, the accessibility API told me that the view had changed to what I expected it to be. That's a sort of very specific example of the general case. The general case is the application under test doesn't need to be a black box. It probably shouldn't be a white box. You shouldn't be sort of delving into um, the very guts uh, of, of the sort of the, the, the JavaScript APIs and, and the page itself, uh, unless that's really what you want to do. Um, but if it could provide a hint, like, hey, I'm in this state. Hey, you know, here's how to find this thing that you care about. That makes your testing a lot easier and a lot less prone to flakiness. Um, so do take a look at getting the application under test to provide hints to make synchronization easier. And finally, um, the Selenium family of tools sort of ends with a thing called Selenium Grid. Uh, Selenium Grid allows you to take the tests that run incredibly slowly because they're end-to-end -end tests um, and run them in parallel. Um, as you run them in parallel, an interesting thing happens. You'll see that even though the tests, when run on their own, are, are rock solid and not prone to flakiness in the slightest, um, you'll find that uh, suddenly flakiness comes back. I've seen this a few times, and uh, what it tends to be is your tests have, have accidentally launched a distributed denial of service uh, attack against the sites that you're actually testing. You're running so many tests in parallel that the underlying infrastructure can't cope. Um, if you see this, dial back the number of parallel tests you're running. It seems obvious. Um, or have a chat with the development team and have a look at the expected load that, that uh, and, a, and a sort of performance criteria that they expect from their system. Um, it's possible that sort of they only ever expect three simultaneous users, and so they've made a bunch of assumptions that sort of rely on that. And if you try and run 20 tests simultaneously, you'll break things. Conversely, they may have expected 600 simultaneous users, um, and you know it's okay then to to run up a lot of tests. And if you see flakiness being introduced at that point, it's probably a good idea to raise that with the development team. So yes, be careful. Once you've made your test solid and you start running them in parallel, you can accidentally bring down the system under test, which is hilarious unless you actually have to try and fix it. Okay, so I think that was uh, just short of half an hour. Um, actually, no, I'll make that half an hour. So um, are there any questions that uh, that has raised and that you would like to ask? Yes, if anybody has any questions, just type them into the control panel and I will ask them of Simon on your behalf. Simon, we already have a few questions coming through here and I'm just conscious of the time, so we're going to get straight into them. Um, okay. the, fir 
The first one is from Dorothy Graham. If you refuse to write code, your tests are doomed to flakiness. I don't agree. However, I would agree that if you don't have technical support, your tests will be flaky. Would you agree with that? Um, I would agree with the statement that uh, if you don't have technical test, uh, support, your tests are flaky. Um, I genuinely believe that testers need to be able to demonstrate uh, their value um, to, to, to the teams they're working with. Um, and uh, one of the problems that we have is a sort of culture of, hey, I'm just going to follow this simple script, and then we're going to be OK. If you're following a simple script, if you're not providing any value other than the fact that you can follow a script, then you know, it's cheaper to get someone offshore to do the work that you're doing. Um, I think one way of providing a unique, a unique value to a team is to be able to uh, do basic automation yourself, to be able to express um, the things you want to test in code um, and have it pushed into things like the continuous builds and so on and so forth. Um, the other advantage is that, that frees you from the drudgery of following this checklist of particular things. Like, why send a human to do something that a machine can do? Um, why not allow yourself the, the pleasure and the space to do things like, you know, um, uh, penetration testing or uh, some of the more sophisticated testing that you know, you as a as a as a fully qualified tester um, can do. Um, so you know, I I think that sort of if you're unable to to code, you're making it far harder to prove your unique value to a project, um, and you're far more likely to be at risk of having someone uh, see you as a cost that could be minimised by being moved overseas. So yeah, I mean, if you can find a way of providing value that, that doesn't involve writing code, fantastic. Um, but I think it's increasingly hard to find that. OK, Simon, another question here from Amir Garay. Do you automate? Sorry, I'll just skip on to the next question. Sure. Do, do you automate stories in isolation and independently, or do you write end-to-end -end scenarios with many verification points, incorporating many stories along the scenario? Yes, um, which is a, a very flippant way of saying that I, I like to do both. Um, while I'm working on a story, I like to have um, a sequence of end-to-end -end tests that describe the sort of happy path through that story. Um, and I can use them like scaffolding right, to verify that I'm on the right direction. Um, by the way, one of the things I didn't mention in this test is testing unhappy paths where various back-end systems goes down is a really difficult thing to do particularly when you start running tests in parallel. So I advise not running those tests end-to-end uh, -end, unless you can guarantee that they're the only tests running at the time. Um, so that's why I say sort of test the happy path uh, as a sort of scaffolding test as you're working on a story. Once a story is complete, however, those end-to-end -end tests uh, have considerably less value. They had a lot of value while you were trying to figure out whether you were heading in the right direction and you were doing the right thing. But do you need to run all of them all the time when you're running tests? Probably not. You know, once the, once the, the feature is released, um, it's probably enough to take a look at the existing um, paths through the application, the additional functionality it adds, and adding that to a larger test suite that tests um, a lot more things um, a bit less thoroughly. So you end up with sort of a, a smoke test that verifies that the application still works, um, and you don't run the scaffolding all the time. In fact, since you're not running it all the time, I may even go as far as deleting it once the uh, functionality of tests is rolled into the smoke tests. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, that's how I like to do it. I know various other teams around the world do things differently. Um, one of the things you will find, though, is that as the number of scaffolding tests goes up, the likelihood of them introducing flakiness also goes up. I mean, you're rolling the dice again, right? Um, so if you can somehow minimize that number, you can minimize the flakiness. And that also reduces the cost of change as you sort of change your UI um, and change the workflow through the application. Your tests shouldn't get in the way of writing good code. Um, is there another question? Yes, Simon, there's a lot of questions coming through. Um, the next one is from Robert Kalanju. 
Will the Selenium RC still be maintained or do we have to move to WebDriver in the near future? Okay, um, so Selenium RC is currently in maintenance mode. Um, we are no longer doing active development on it, but we are trying to make sure it doesn't break um, or lose functionality uh, from where it is right now. Um, in the, the, the current development effort is all focused on WebDriver. Uh, one of the interesting pieces of development effort that, that is going on right now is a W3C standard. So the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, are the people who set a lot of the um, specifications that we use on the net day to day. Um, WebDriver is in front of them uh, and we're working with browser vendors to implement the WebDriver APIs in the browser themselves. So the Chrome team already do this. Um, Opera Software were actually the first guys to do this uh, independently. Um, they were the ones that sort of showed how effective the, the, the strategy could be. Uh, and they run in the order of several million tests a day uh, to verify that Opera, the web browser, works uh, as it should. It's incredibly fast and it's a wonderful thing to see. Um, we're working with Mozilla uh, on a project called Marionet, which will bake the WebDriver APIs uh, into release versions of Firefox and Firefox OS, the sort of um, you know, the new mobile phone operating system that Mozilla are working on. Um, so, I mean, the, the end result is that Selenium RC uh, was a fantastic API for the time, um, but the active development is going in right now to WebDriver. So, uh, that does raise the question, like, do I have to rewrite every single one of my tests? I mean, you've probably got thousands of the things, right? Hundreds and hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of lines of code using Selenium RC? Um, the answer to that question is, no, you don't need to rewrite. Uh, we provide a uh, implementation called a WebDriver backed Selenium, which allows you, which implements the standard Selenium API, um, you know, the Java API, but backs it with WebDriver. Um, there's a couple of caveats for that, of course. Uh, the first one is, it's not backed by Selenium Core. So if you do a get eval and call BrowserBot in any way, or Selenium.something, um, chances are your test will need to be tweaked a little bit, but it shouldn't be too hard. Um, if you go to the uh, selenium.hq.org, uh, there is an appendix in the documentation about how to migrate your tests. Um, this sort of allow, uh, the, the strategy that we sort of advise is to do a sort of piecemeal upgrade um, as and when you touch things. I expect there to be some small number of Selenium RC tests remaining. Um, but if possible, sort of writing new tests in WebDriver is a really good way to go. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, feel free to reach out to me uh, on Twitter, SHS96C, uh, or at the Selenium uh, developers or Selenium users or WebDriver mailing lists. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to give you some slightly more concrete advice on how to do that translation to WebDriver. Simon, there's still a lot of questions coming through, but I'm just conscious of the time. We're actually running out of time at the moment, so um, you might be able to answer them in a blog post for us after the um, the webinar. I'd be happy to. Very good. Okay. Um, thanks to everybody for attending, and t thanks also to Simon for another excellent presentation. Uh, we'd hope to see some of you at this year's conference in Amsterdam. This webinar has now concluded. Have a nice day.